Good evening, or is it good morning? Well, that would depend on whether this is real time or a flashback. And if this is a flashback, whose flashback is it? Am I really Eddie Muller, host of Noir Alley, or someone else's recollection of Eddie Muller? Perhaps I'm only an avatar representing someone else's interpretation of me. Is this too complicated for you? Well, I'm just trying to prepare you for today's film. The Locket, a 1946 release from RKO Pictures, known in these parts as the House of Noir. Flashbacks are a distinguishing feature of this film. For years, they'd been a valuable storytelling device, but in film noir, they became a defining trope. Double Indemnity, Out of the Past, Mildred Pierce, Criss Cross, Sunset Boulevard, all these films and many more would be totally different without a structure built on flashbacks especially if it allowed for an evocative and often explicative voiceover narration. The locket takes flashbacks to a whole new level, the narrative spiraling into a flashback within a flashback within a flashback. Moviegoers in 1946 would be lost if they walked in during the middle, as lots of people did back then. But the brilliance of the locket is that it's complex without being confusing. Credit writer Sheridan Gibney, who adapted it from a script called What Nancy Wanted by Norma Barsman. The script had been sold to RKO by actor Hume Cronin, who originally bought it from Barsman with the intention of Nancy being played by his wife, Jessica Tandy. Director John Brahm was borrowed from 20th Century Fox, where he'd just made a couple of stylish horror noir hybrids, The Lodger and Hangover Square. Brahm was part of the wave of talented German filmmakers who came to Hollywood in the 30s to escape the Nazis. All of the pictures he made between 1944 and 1947 are notable for their stark, brooding visual style, especially his rarely seen Raymond Chandler adaptation, The Brasher Doubloon, which makes sunny Los Angeles look like something out of the Three Penny Opera. Abetted by RKO's ace cameraman, Nicholas Musaraka, Brahm created one of his most visually stunning films in The Locket. It also gave Robert Mitchum one of his most unusual roles in his early career. He's not a cowboy or a private eye, but a sensitive artist with the very un-Mitchum-like name Norman Clyde. This would be the last supporting role of Mitchum's career. He just received a Best Supporting Actor nomination for his role as Lieutenant Walker in the story of G.I. Joe, and by the end of the following year, he'd be the biggest box office star at RKO. The real star of this movie, however, is its leading lady, Lorraine Day. Having spent her career typically playing some fella's chipper girlfriend, she was fortunate that the producer of the locket, Bert Granite, was a personal friend. They both realized this might be the best part she'd ever get, and Granite stayed loyal to Lorraine, even when bigger names like sisters Joan Fontaine and Olivia de Havilland campaigned for the part. Ironically, Lillian Fontaine, the mother of Olivia and Joan, does appear in the movie, playing a small role as Lady Wyndham. Lorraine Day was thrilled to have three wonderful actors supporting her. She was already a fan of veterans Brian Ahern and Gene Raymond, actors who'd been big stars in the 30s, but by the mid-40s were mostly playing character parts. And although she was excited to have RKO's fastest rising star in her movie, she was dumbfounded that Mitchum wouldn't speak to her on the set, especially since they'd served an apprenticeship together at the Long Beach Playhouse. Apparently, Mitchum felt that Day had given him the brush off years earlier when she'd been the rising star and he was still scraping for work. Soon enough, their careers were headed in opposite directions. Mitchum became famous. And although Lorraine Day did too, it was mostly for being the wife of legendary baseball manager Leo DeRocher. In fact, Lorraine Day was better known as the first lady of baseball than for her acting roles. So as it turned out, she was spot on about this role. She'd never again get one as challenging, and it remained her favorite film. Another film about repressed memory came out right about this time, Alfred Hitchcock's Spellbound. Now, it may have had bigger stars, 
and dream sequences designed by Salvador Dali, but to me, it doesn't hold a candle to the deep, disturbing pleasures of this film. Prepare to spiral deep into the mysteries of the locket.